Welcome to What the Bible Says. In this lesson, we will look at the Blue Springs Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Please join us for this important Bible study. Well, hello and welcome to our program tonight, What the Bible Says. We are glad that you have taken the time to tune in and be with us tonight. We are on YouTube. We're on Facebook Live. If you want to interact with us, you can go to Facebook Live and you can type in your questions down there when you click on the video and you'll be able to ask questions on Facebook Live or you'll be able to call into the program at 816-229-2021 for your questions or comments. Um, let me turn this down. If you are watching our program on another site where this uh, program has been cross-posted, if you post anything on that site, once the program's over, I can't see what you're posting. So if you want to post questions that I'll be able to see when the program's over, you need to come over to our Facebook webpage and you need to click on the live video and then you can type your questions in there. I get lots of people out there that are asking questions and then I get an email saying you never answered my questions because I can't see the questions. So um, if you want your question to be seen after the program's over, you have to come and post on our Facebook live um, thread streaming thing whatever <laughs> you have to you have to post on that uh i'm donald gellis i'm the minister here at the blue springs church of christ this is leland reed uh leland and i are just christians and christians only mm. are you a hyphenated christian no, leland absolutely not you're not a baptist christian i'm not a baptist christian presbyterian I'm not a Mormon christian, christian presbyterian. oh man I'm a Christian. That's right. This program deals with the era of denominationalism and cultism. And what we do is we expose the denominations, Baptist, Methodist, Catholic, Presbyterian, Seventh-day Adventist, you name it, um, who claim to be Christians, but they're not. And the Mormon church would fall into that as well. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, they are not um, Christians. They have not obeyed the gospel plan Community of, of salvation. A lot of they calls. use that term as well. So uh, tonight's program is going to be on the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. They're better known as Mormons. And so we welcome any of your calls and questions. Let me remind you, we like to begin our program uh, reminding you of an offer that we have. Well, we have two offers. The first one is we'd love to send to you absolutely free this book, Why I Am a Member of the Church of Christ. It's a great book. It has detailed information that addresses the topic of how one becomes a New Testament Christian and why one is a New Testament Christian. Now, here's the thing. This book has to be read alongside with the Bible. You have to check these scripture references. You have to go to the Word of God and see if these things are being true. Um, read these things and see for yourself, okay? But we'd love to send you this book. It's got detailed information about the church you read about in the New Testament, and um, I think you'd really enjoy it. We'll send it to you absolutely free. Just give me your name and mailing address, and we will get it to you. And when I say free, I mean free. We do not solicit, solicit funds from non-members of the Blue Springs Church Christ. We're not going to ask you for any money. We don't want you to send us any money. We don't want any of that. We'll send this to you free. We also would like to study the Bible with you. We can do that two ways. The first way is you can do it by correspondence. We'd love to send you this Bible study, Search for Truth. Again, it's absolutely free. We pay the postage to mail it to you, and we give you the postage to mail it back to us. So if you're interested in that, we'd love to send that to you. Or if you're in the greater Kansas City area, the Blue Springs area, and you would like to meet in person, we're happy to study with you in person. Um, anywhere you'd like to meet and come to our building, we can go to you, we can go to a coffee shop, wherever you'd like to meet. And we'd love to do this Bible study with you as well in person. So if you're interested in the Bible study, which is absolutely free, and you're interested in the book, which is absolutely free, and what does it cost you though, Leland? Time. Time. I thought you were going to get it wrong. Okay. It's, I mean, if you, if you take the correspondence course or if you do the in-home study, you're looking at approximately 45 minutes. Time. Uh, the, the book will take you a little longer than that. But, but again, in the book, you can go any chapter. You don't have to go, you know, road from cover to cover. You can start the back, go with the other way. It doesn't make any difference because each chapter is, is covered a certain part. Yeah, each chapter, that's a good point. Each chapter is independent. It stands on its own. It covers a different topic. So you can look down and say, oh, this looks like an interesting topic. And you can go to that chapter and read it. Uh, say you read chapter 9, 
Chapter 9 doesn't have anything to do with chapter 10. It's a whole different topic. So you can turn back and forth and read the topic that uh, topics that you like. I, I, it's a great book. I think you'll really enjoy it. So if you'd like it, get in contact with us, and we will send you a copy of that book. Well, let's get into our program tonight. We're talking about the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. We're talking about the Mormon Church. Uh, we're going to explore several different areas tonight. The first one is we're going to talk about uh, Bible contradictions between uh, the Bible and Mormons, where they differ, and which one we should choose. Uh, Leland has a segment on... on um, well, Not the Godhead. Mormons, Mormons no. becoming gods. Mormons becoming gods. And so Leland is going to cover that for us in just a little bit. Um, but let's begin with a little bit of background. Um, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, this is a history by Alvin Jennings, by the way. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, better known as the Mormon Church, was organized on April 6, 1830 in Fayette, New York, with six members by Joseph Smith, Jr., Smith, about uh, 1,800 years too late. 1,830 years too late right. to be the church that you read about in the New Testament. Right. Absolutely. Smith, following in the footsteps of his father, a roving water witch, became known as Peepstone Joe because he claimed to have miraculously discovered a peepstone. At the age of 14, he began to have visions and revelations, being perplexed about the religious confusion of his day and the many conflicting denominations and their varied interpretations of the scriptures. Well, he was on to something. Denominations aren't of God. That's right. They're not. <laughs> um, he uh, said he received in uh, the woods one day a vision of a great light. Instructions from God were not to join any of the sects because God was about to restore the ancient gospel that had not been represented in its fullness by any of the churches existing at that time. Uh, according to his statements, three years later, he had a night vision in which Moroni, an angel, appeared before him and revealed to him the hiding place of a certain plate of gold on which was inscribed the gospel. He was instructed by the angel to visit this place on the uh, same date each year, September 22nd, 1827, and he was permitted to receive the plates at age 21. He then translated the records, dictating the translation, and let me say this, um, just, just so... Those Mormons who are watching, I don't mean any disrespect by this, but there are some uh, there are some words that we don't use, and so I might not say it correctly, and I don't mean any disrespect by that. So I don't want you to think if I don't miss if I mispronounce one of the books uh, that you all use, I'm I'm not trying to be disrespectful to you. Um, I just want want you to know that. Um, but um, the, uh, he dictated his translation to Oliver Cowdery and others who wrote it down. It was completed in 1829 and placed in the hands of a printer in August 1829. In the same year, on May 15th, Smith and Cowdery said that an angel, John the Baptist, appeared to them and conferred upon them the Arianic priesthood and commanded them to baptize each other by immersion. Later, three glorious personages, Peter, James, and John, conferred the McCasaldic priesthood upon them and gave them the apostleship. These events were followed by the organization of the church at Fayette, um, April 6, 1830, with all of its ancient gifts and powers. So, again, that's a brief introduction. Um, each week when we explore a different denomination, uh, we can just have time to do a brief introduction before we can really get into any of the particulars and stuff. So um, just know that, you know, which we could be more detailed in that, but we can't. Uh, I'm going to begin tonight in dealing with Bible contradictions between the Bible and the Mormons. Um, have your Bible handy. You're going to need it if you're going to follow along with our program tonight. Um, turn over to um, Micah chapter 5. Turn in your Old Testament. Oh, fact. Turn, yeah, Micah chapter 5. Let me, I have to switch over to a uh, different translation here. Uh, here we go. Uh, let's say uh, Micah, Micah chapter 5 and verse 2. Uh, the Bible prophesied that Jesus would be born in Bethlehem. And Micah says this, But you, Bethlehem of Paphrathah, 
Though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel, whose going forth are from old, from everlasting. So the prophecy of Micah is that things are going to happen in Bethlehem. Go over to the Gospel of Luke. Luke chapter 2, and beginning in verse 1. It says, And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. The census first took place while Quirinius was governor governing Syria. So all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. Um, Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was the house of the house and lineage of David. Stay there in Luke, over to chapter 2. Luke chapter 2, and go down to uh, verse 11. Luke 2 and verse 11. For there is born to you this day in the city of David. And what city is that? Bethlehem. That's Bethlehem. Uh, a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be the sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swallowing cloths, lying in a manger. So the prophecy is that, um, that Jesus would be born in Bethlehem uh, in Micah. The fulfillment of it is seen in the Gospel of Luke. The, again, the foretelling of it in Luke chapter 2 or excuse me, uh, Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 5, and then the birth announcement in Luke chapter 2, verses 11 through 12, you have that. Um, also you have, if you go over to Matthew chapter 2, Matthew chapter 2 and verse 1, Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from, Jer from the east came to Jerusalem, so here you have people coming from Jerusalem to Bethlehem. My geography, you know, isn't the best, but seven miles, nine miles, not very far. So they came from Jerusalem to Bethlehem to see Jesus. So the Bible prophesied that Jesus would be born in Bethlehem. The Book of Mormon, however, contradicts this. The Book of Mormon said that Jesus would be born in Jerusalem. In Alma chapter 7 and verse 10, it says, And behold, he shall be born of Mary at Jerusalem, which is the land of our forefathers, she being a virgin. Now, I know Jerusalem's mentioned in that narrative because they came from Jerusalem to Bethlehem. But the Bible says that Jesus would be born in Bethlehem, not Jerusalem. What are you going to believe? The Bible or are you going to believe the Book of Mormon? Well, you find out if you go and read the context or on Matthew one or Matthew two, start one and verse one. They went to Jerusalem because that's where Herod was, and they asked Herod about about the Son of God, and then of course he he didn't know anything about it, so right sent them on their way. But. Right. So um, you have to make a choice who you're going to follow. Well, our encouragement is that you follow the Word of God, that you follow the Bible. Here's the second thing. The Bible says believers were first called Christians at Paul's, um, after Paul's ministry in Antioch. If you go over to Acts chapter 11 and verse 26. Acts chapter 11 and verse 26. It says this, And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. When he found Paul, he brought him to Antioch. So it was that for a whole year they assembled with the church and taught a great many people and the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. So it's the first mention of those who are belonging to Christ, those who are followers of Christ. Before that, they were referred to as disciples, but they get a specific designation in Antioch that separates them as followers of Jesus Christ, and they're called um, Christians. So the Bible says they were first called Christians in Antioch. The Book of Mormon claims that people were known by this title as early as 73 B.C. That this title was, was, this designation was known. Alma chapter 46 and verse 15. Yea, all those who were true believers in Christ took upon them gladly the name of Christ, or Christians as they were called, because of their belief in Christ who should come. B.C. is a long time before, yeah. before the events that we're talking about here that are taking place in the New Testament. And so you have to make a choice. Who's right? The Bible or is it the Book of Mormon? 
Well, the other thing about it is, if, if in fact they were called Christians clear back there, what was it, 40, 147 BC or something like that? The church? That. Yeah, but why, why is, what, does not history show that? Yeah, why is it absent in, in history? Right. Yeah. That's I mean, you, you go back in history and see when people are starting to be called Christians, it's in history. Hi, history backs up what the Bible says because the Bible is true. Right. And the issue comes down to the term Christians. Of course, those in the denominations call themselves Christians, but they're not. No. They're not Christians. They're Baptists or Methodists or Catholics or Presbyterians. They're not New Testament well, if Christians. If you ask them, you know, what faith are you? You say, well, I'm a Baptist. Right. I'm a Methodist or, I'm a, you know, I'm a Baptist Christian. They're not. They're a hyphenated Christian. That's right. They are. And the same thing is true with Mormons. Um, they are not New Testament Christians. They have not obeyed the gospel plan of salvation, which is requi required for all men to obey. So therefore, they can't wear a name that they are not entitled to. Now, I know they call themselves Christians. I get it. But they're not. Okay? They haven't obeyed the gospel plan of salvation. Speaking about the church, the, um, the Bible teaches that during Jesus' ministry, uh, he spoke of the church as being something in the future. Go over to Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16, and look beginning in verse 18. It says this, And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Jesus talks about the future, will build, not have built, not did build. He talks about it in the future tense. He says that I will build my church. Well, in other words, it wasn't in existence 147 years before Christ. No, it wasn't in existence all those years before Christ. Um, so the, the Bible says that he would build it, okay? In Acts chapter 2, in Acts chapter 2 and verse 47, you see that the church has been established, established in, in Acts chapter 2. At the beginning of it, you see the, you see the church coming. But in Acts chapter 2 and verse 47, it says, Praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily those who are being saved. So here you have the connection, I will build, and then you have the church. So in, in, in the Matthew 16, 18, you couldn't be added to something that didn't exist. Right. No and then, that's right. And then in Acts chapter 2, you're added to that which does exist. Acts chapter 11, or I mean Acts chapter 2 and verse 47. The church was established on the... The of Pentecost in AD 33. That's right. It's just that simple. That's right. The only true church was established on that day. The Mormon church is 1,800 years too late. Right. You know, the Baptists are 1,600 years too too late. The, the Catholics are six to 900 years too late. Uh, so, so the Bible teaches that during Jesus' ministry, he spoke as the church as something in the future. The Book of Mormon claims the Christian church was established as early as 147 B.C. And again, I don't mean any disrespect if I don't get the, the, the name of some of these books right. But it, it looks like Mosiah, uh, chapter 18 and verse 17, and they were called the Church of God or the Church of Christ from that time forward. No mentioning of that of history, no recording of that in history. And sometimes I think the Mormons like to get their prophecies backward. You, you know what I mean? It, prophecy was spoken of, and then its fulfillment was later. Right. What you have with, with the, the writings of, of Joseph Smith is, is the events already happened, right. already occurred. And then miraculously, he reads back and gets information about what it was going to do. So the event came first before the prophecy came. That doesn't make it a prophecy. It, it doesn't make it a prophecy. Make, That's not the way it works. That, that would be history if it was true. That's right. That's right. So we see that. So what are you going to choose? Are you going to choose what the Bible says about the church, or are you going to choose what the Book of Mormon says about the church? Um, the Bible, the uh, Bible teaches that during uh, Jesus's ministry, or excuse me, I did that one. The Bible teaches that all of King Zedekiah's sons were killed. Um, go over to uh, Jeremiah. Jeremiah. And I want you to go to chapter 39, 39 and verse 6. Then the king of Babylon killed the sons, plural, of Zedekiah before his eyes in Riblah. The king of Babylon also killed all the nobles of Judah. 
So the Bible says that the sons of Zedekiah were killed, okay? But the, the Book of Mormon says that's not true. The Book of Mormon says, or would have you believe, that one son of King Zedekiah escaped and came to America, um, the Americas. Um, how can that be when it says in verse 6, a plural, his sons were killed before his eyes? Okay, But the Book of Mormon in Helmsman 6 and verse 10 says the land north called Mulek, uh, Malek, which was after the son of Zedekiah, for the Lord did bring Mulek into the land north. Well, how is that possible? The Bible says that there was no son that was left. But one of them has to be wrong. Right. It's, it's, you can't have the contradictions that we see in what the Book of Mormon says compared to what the Bible says. One of them can't be wrong. They can't both be right. That's right. That's right. They, they could both be wrong, but we know that the Bible is correct. So therefore, the Book of Mormons has to be the one that's false. It's wrong. That's, that's true. It's a false teaching. The, the Mormons claim that the Book of Mormon is a second testament or another testament of Jesus Christ. Um, but we don't need a second testament. We don't need another testament of Jesus Christ. We have the first and final uh, testament of Jesus Christ. Go over to John. The Gospel of John, chapter 20. And look beginning in verse 30 says this, and truly, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. Did John need a second witness? No. Did John need another witness? No. Okay. Were the things that John wrote in this book not set sufficient enough to say who Jesus Christ is? What about Second Peter 1.3? 2 Peter 1.3. And, and the thing is, to say that you need another testament is to say that, wait a minute, the first uh, wasn't good enough for you to, to do that. Second Peter 1, 3, according to his divine power, and I were talking about God, right. hath given unto us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. So if he give us all things, why do we need the Book of Mormon right. or any other uh, denominational book that it's out there. Well, we don't. We, we have the Bible, and that is it has everything we need for life and God. Uh, it reminds me of uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2. And uh, or, uh, chapter 2, 2 Timothy chapter 3, and verse 16, where Paul says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof for correction, for instruction in righteousness, all Scripture. How can that include the Book of Mormon when it doesn't come along till over a thousand years later? Exactly. Well, the, the church comes 1,800 years. So how can that be the Book of Mormon? How can that be called Scripture? It's not. No. Scripture was fulfilled in the lifetime of the first century. Well, and again, you go back to the contradictions between the, the, the Bible and the, the, the Book, Book of Mormon. Mormon. Book of Mormon is the one that's contradicting. It's not the Bible. Right. Right. Um, look at Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2, and go down to verse 16. Paul is talking, and he's talking in this context about his preaching. He says, In the day when God will judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ, according to my gospel. Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy 4 and verse 2 to preach the word. Paul preached the gospel of Jesus Christ. We know that in Galatians chapter 1 and verse 6, because he said, I marvel that you are le you're leaving so soon to another gospel, which is not a gospel. So Paul preached the gospel. If we have the gospel, why do we need another testament? Why do we need another account? Why do well, we it's simply it's, it's false because it's not really, it's not inspired by God. If you really, if you take that book of Mormons and read it and all the things it says, and it, it's, it's not even mentioned. Right, right. Um, they're, they're trying to take what we've been given in Scripture and to convince people, oh, this is, this is in accordance with Scripture. This, this complements Scripture. No, it doesn't. It contradicts Scripture. Not when you're saying he was born, the Bible says he was born in Bethlehem, and, and then they say he was born in Jerusalem. Jerusalem. There's quite a bit of difference. It is. Nine mile difference. <laughs> Seven, nine miles. Um, Who caught the baby in, in Jerusalem? 
Do they, must, they must have thrown him to. They must have thrown him. Um, what what you have is you have these inconsistencies that are coming up, and they are challenging what the Bible says and wanting you to change what the Bible says to accept what they are saying. And that's the accepting of error. I gave you uh, Galatians chapter 1. I mentioned it, but let me give it to you again. Galatians chapter 1, beginning in verse 6. He says, I marvel that you are turning away so, so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another, but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than what you have received, let him be accursed. They preach another gospel. So in other words, if if in fact an angel, an angel and I, I don't believe it for one minute, appeared to Joseph Smith, he's accursed. Right. And the angel and him Preach both. any other gospel right. to you. Because it's a perverted gospel. It is it's not the true gospel. I mean, they're not even they're not even true Christians. No. Uh, and and maybe I need to qualify that. I understand they call themselves Christians. I understand it. I understand the Baptists and the Methodists and the Catholics do the same thing, but they're not, friends. They're not New Testament Christians because they haven't obeyed the gospel plan of salvation. Okay? Until they're willing to obey and understand the gospel plan of salvation, they can't become a New Testament Christian. They're in the same batch with all the denominational uh, denominationalists who want to claim the title Christian, but they haven't done what the Bible says uh, to become they, a Christian. They've obeyed man's rule for, that, for salvation, and that won't save it. That's right. That's right. Instead of God's rules for um, salvation. Uh, let me give you some other ones. Um, the Mormons teach that the gospel is to be taken first to the Gentiles and then to the Jews. And the Doctrine and Covenants, Covenants chapter 90 in verse 9. But the Bible teaches opposite of that. If you go to Romans chapter 1, Romans chapter 1 and verse 16, it says this, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. They've got it backwards in a contradiction with what the word of God well, says. Look at that verse again. The gospel is is the power of God unto salvation, not the Book of Mormon. The gospel. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. But they would have you believe that the Book of Mormon is equal to the Bible, but it's not equal to. It's 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 a man made book with man made prophecies and teachings in it, right? Uh, and so um, it's not the Word of God, or can be compared. To the Word of God. So you have to decide, are you going to trust what the Bible says, or are you going to trust what the Book of Mormon says? So a person has to make a uh, decision. Uh, here's another one. Mormons teach that God commanded Abraham to take Hagar as his wife. This again is in Doctrine and Covenants, uh, chapter 132 and verse 34. But the Bible says that Sarah told Abraham to have a child with her. Um, uh, to Abraham to take Hagar to have a child with him. Go over to Genesis chapter 16. Genesis chapter 16. And look at verse 2. Sarai becomes Sarah. Abram becomes Abraham. She's not happy. She doesn't have a child. Right. So Sarai said to Abram, See now, the Lord has restrained me from bearing children. Please go into my maid. Perhaps I shall obtain children by her. And Abram heeded the voice of Sarah, Sarah, not, not God. He heeded the voice of his wife. So here you have yet another contradiction. You have the Book of Mormon saying one thing, and you have the Word of God, the Bible, saying something different. They're in contradiction with one another. Which are you going to choose? You can choose to follow the Bible or a book that came 1,800 years later. Well, if you want to go to heaven, better choose the, better Bible. Choose the Bible. Well, again, you know, and, uh, you have the, when we talk about Christians and we talk about all the promises that Christians have of heaven, heaven is a promise that's given only to Christians. Right. So they don't even have the promise of heaven because they're not Christians. That's pretty serious. Pretty serious. 
Uh, Mormons teach that um, there are those who have not sinned. And you see this in the writings of Doctrine and Covenants, chapter 49 and verse 8. It says, I will that all men shall repent, for all are under sin, except those which I have reserved unto myself, holy men that ye know not of. But the Bible says something different about that. The Bible says in Romans chapter 3, in verse 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The Greek word all there is pos. It means absolutely everything. So everyone, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. It doesn't sound like there's a few no. that have escaped. All have sinned. If, if, you're, if you're human, you have sinned. That's right. Galatians, Christ is the only one who was tempted in all ways as we are, yet was without, without sin. sin. And he came in the flesh. Uh, uh, John 1 and verse 14. He's the only one. That's how he can be the sacrificial, uh, sacrificial lamb of God. In Genesis chapter, uh, in Galatians chapter three, and if you look at verse twenty-two, it says this: "But the Scripture has confined all under sin, that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe." The Scripture has confined all under sin. Let me see. We've got some stuff here. If you're on Facebook Live, we're checking it every so often. Right. Okay. So again, you have to choose. Are you going to accept the Bible? Or are you going to accept the Book of Mormon, a book that was written by man? Okay. Um, Mormons teach that man is also in the beginning with God. That he was in the beginning with God. Doctrine and Covenants, chapter 93 and verse 29. But the Bible teaches that man was created by God. In fact, created by God on the sixth day. Go over to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1, beginning in verse 26. It says this, Then God said, Let us make man in our image. He's talking about the Godhead there. Let us, the Godhead. Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, see, I have given you every herb that yields seed, which is on the face of all the earth, and every tree whose fruit yields seed. To you it shall be for food. Also to every beast of the earth, to every bird of the air, and to everything that creeps on the earth in which there is life, I have given every green herb for food. And it was so. Then God saw everything that he had made. This is the sixth day. And indeed, it was very good. So the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Man doesn't come about, not on day one, not on day two, not on day three, day six. Man isn't there in the beginning. God created the heavens and the earth. Man isn't there with God when he brings about his creative ability or when he displays his creative ability. Man's not there. Stay there in Genesis. Go to chapter two. Scroll down and look at verse seven. Again, it talks about the creation of man. And the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being, a living being, inepesh. Man became flesh, began to live. So uh, they would have you believe that man existed with God. The Bible says no, that man was created by God, that he is a creation of God. There's no pre-existence of man. There is a beginning of man. And, uh, right. Some of the notes I got here, they talk about there's no beginning of man, no beginning of, it, of the world even. But there is. Genesis 1 and 2 tells us the beginning of both man and the world. Right. Um, God is eternal. Man is immortal. Right. Man has a beginning but no end. God is eternal. No beginning, no end. And sometimes we get that mixed up. Right. You know, we get begin to place ourselves on the same realm as, as God, and, and we, we've got to be careful um, in doing that. Uh, let me give you another one. Um, Mormons teach that man gets a second chance at salvation after he dies. 
Uh, they teach that in Doctrine and Covenants, chapter 138 and verse 30. Yet the Bible teaches that man's fate is fixed when he dies. Go over to Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 27. And as it is appointed for man to die once and then have a second chance so that he can then accept Jesus Christ as his Lord. And so you're, looking at, so. you're looking at me crazy. Yes. It's not what it says. No, it is. It says, and as it, a, and as it is appointed for men to die once, but after this, the judgment. So where's the second chance? There is no second chance. I always say to people, you never get a second chance at the second coming. That's it. You see it in Luke chapter 16 in the story of the rich man and Lazarus. You see that the, the rich man had no possibility of a second chance. His fate was fixed when he died. Yet they would have you believe that you get a second chance after death. But that's not what the Bible says. What are you going to believe? The Bible? Or are you going to believe what Mormons teach? Uh, Mormons teach that God has flesh and bones as tangible as man's flesh and bones. Doctrine and Covenants, chapter 130 and verse 22. But the Bible teaches that God is a spirit. Go over to John chapter 4. John chapter 4 and verse 24. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. Now, I think some of the things that they might get confused with is what we call anthropomorphisms, um, where God appears in a way that man can understand. Um, Moses saw the back of God. Does God literally have a back? No. He appeared anthropomorphically in a way that Moses could see. Um, the Bible says no man has ever seen God. No man can see God and live. Um, so God has appeared in anthropomorphisms, okay? Um, God has appeared in theophanies. He's appeared in different ways in nature. Um, but God himself is a spirit. Uh, he doesn't have a body, as they would say, as tangible as, as man's. I've got a few more, but we're, we're getting away on our time, so I want to give you time. Let me say this. If you have any questions or comments, you're welcome to call us at 816-229-2021, or you can go over. I'm checking Facebook Live right now to see if we have any questions on Facebook Live. I don't see any. If you are watching this and you're watching it cross-posted on another platform, um, you have to come over and, po and go to our Facebook page and post um, your questions underneath the video, the live feed video that's going. So we'll be able to see them now and after the live broadcast is, is over. Uh, Brother Leland, what do you have for us? I have uh, the Mormons teach that if you're good enough, you get exalted and become a god. Okay. Uh, first thing I want to say about it is there's nowhere in the, in the Bible, Old Testament or New Testament, that tells us that man becomes a god. Correct. Uh, Not one place in the New Testament. Place. I mean, look, look at Mark chapter 12. Mark chapter 12. And I'll, I'll, I'll give you, well, let's, let's do this first. I have several quotes from, from uh, Doctrines and Covenants and, and Joseph Fielding Smith and others that says that man becomes God. Right. Uh, let, let's cover some of them just for the sure. fun. In, in Doctrines and Covenants, and this would be in number 20, they shall be gods. I'm not going to read the whole thing because it's too time consuming. And then it goes on down a little bit further. It says, they shall be gods. Verily I say unto you, except ye abide in my by my law, ye cannot attain to this glory, becoming a god. And then uh, Joseph Smith taught himself the straightness of the way, and he says in there, become gods themselves. Right. Then you go over to uh, Joseph Fielding Smith and Doctrines of, Sal of, of Salvation, page, volume 1, page 97-98. All exalted men become gods. Joseph Smith taught that there was a plurality of gods. Correct. Well, look at look at uh, Mark chapter twelve. So I can get this thing to work. In. Mark chapter twelve, and we want verse thirty-two. And the scribe said unto him, Well, master, thou hast said the truth, for there is one God, and there is none other but he. 
uh, look at Romans chapter 3, verse 30. Romans chapter 3 and verse 30. Seeing it, seeing it is one God which shall justify the circumcision by faith and the uncircumcision through faith. Uh, then we got 1 Corinthians 8, 6, and I'm right now I'm just giving you New Testament. There's, there's verses in the Old Testament that tell you the same thing. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 6. But to us there is but one God, the Father of of whom all things are all things, and we in him, and our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by him. Uh, another one, we got Ephesians chapter 4, verse 6. Ephesians chapter 4, and we want verse 6. One God and Father of all, who is above all, and through all, and in you all. How many times does God have to say there's only one well, God? How many times? And then we got... Uh, 1 Timothy 2 5. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 5. There is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Then look at uh, James chapter 2, verse 19. James chapter 2 and verse 19. It's this. Uh, might not be the best verse to use, but it'll work. Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. So his point, the point is, Singular. there is one God. Singular. All there is. You know, what, uh, well, let, let's cover a little more what the, what, the, what the Mormons say here. Here's Joseph Fielding Smith Jr. again on Doctrines of Salvation, Volume 2, page 48. The Father has promised us that through our faithfulness we shall be blessed with the fullness of his kingdom. In other words, we will have the privilege of becoming like him. To become God, like him, we God. must, yeah, but, but to become like him, we must have all the powers of the Godhood. I haven't found the word Godhood in the Bible. Or I've found Godhead. Yeah, Godhood is, is used in the Old King James. In the Old King James, okay. Thus a man and his wife, when glorified, will have spirit children who eventually will go on and, and earth like this one we are on and pass through the same kind of experiences being subject to mortal conditions. It is faith is, and if faithful, they will also receive the fullness of exaltation and partake of the same blessings. There is no end to this development. It will go on forever. We will become gods and have jurisdiction over worlds, and, and these worlds will be peopled by our own offspring. I've got to bring up this. Now, the Bible tells us that we're not going to have be married in heaven. But anyway, some other verses I got here on, on God, Malachi 2.10, have we not all one father, have not one God? No, don't have to read the whole thing, but go you can keep it and look at it. And Mark 12, 32, and ascribe to well, we just read that a while ago in Romans 3, 30. I went through this, and, and there's so much to, to turn, turn, show you that, that there is only one God. Uh, look at uh, Isaiah chapter, Isaiah here. Get it going here again. From Isaiah, and we want chapter 43 and verse 10 and 11. You are my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that ye may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. I, even I, am the Lord, and besides me there is no Savior. Uh, look at uh, Isaiah 44, 6. Isaiah 44 and verse 6. Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts. I am the first, and I am the last, and beside me there is no God. 
and I've got several more verses that I don't think I need to cover. I want to get into another part of this thing about God. Well, I, I was going to mention Acts 11 and 29. Yeah. Therefore, since we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the, that the Godhead is like gold or silver. So Godhead. Well, did I, did I hear you wrong? No, the Godhead, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there's a Godhead. You just... Or God the Father, oh, God the Son. Godhood. No. Godhood. No. no God the God X X X yeah. X seventeen twenty nine uses Godhead. You're right. absolutely right. right. I don't know why I thought. Yeah, you there, there's, okay. I don't, Godhood is not. I've no. never seen it in the Bible. No. Godhead. Yes. I was thinking Godhead. <laughs> let's, let's look at let's look at another thing Forgive here me. that they talk they talk about uh, having being married and being having children and stuff and and in this new world that they're going to have. Right. What does the Bible say about what happens to us when, when after we die and when we go to heaven? Look at Matthew chapter 22, verse 30. Matthew 22, verse 30. For in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. So we're not going to be married. How, can we, how are we going to have children? Right, spirit children. And then look at Mark chapter 12, verse 25. Mark chapter 12, verse 25. 25? Yeah, verse 25. When they shall rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels which are in heaven. Then look at Luke 17, 27. Luke chapter 17, verse 27. They did eat, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark. And the, well, I did that was the wrong verse. I didn't need that one. But they they were they were destroyed. They didn't they didn't marry anymore. Oh, yeah, on in on on the uh, in the in the world you 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 right. You drink, you eat, and you marry wives. Right. But not that's never not said heaven. of being in heaven that you eat, you drink, and you marry wives. Yeah. Look at uh, Luke twenty, uh, chapter twenty, verse thirty-four. Luke twenty, verse thirty-four. And Jesus answering said unto them, "Children of this world marry and are given in marriage. Children, Children of, of this of the world, yeah." Then in Luke 20, 35, but they which shall be accounted worthy to obtain that world and the resurrection from the dead, neither marry nor are given in marriage. So, you know, they come through, you go through all of this stuff about uh, how they're having children and they're exalted and they have, go in there, become gods and they have their own world and all that. That's a bunch of nonsense. And then, of course, another one that I that, that, uh, wanted to hit on, they... Uh, we talk about one place that said, I've got to find it on my paper here, but I'm going to read it. Um, it talks about them having wives in the plural. Um, that's something we know that the, the, the Mormons have uh, taught for many years. And, and oh, another one, too, they talk here in, in Milton R. Hunter, Pearl of Great Price, Price, commentary, page 144 and 145. He talks about the Heavenly Mother. I have never read, and and I've read the Bible through several times. I have never seen that statement in the Bible, a heavenly mother. It shows the doctrine of man. Right. It shows what these men are writing, and it's not in accordance with the word of God. Again, are you going to believe the Bible or Mormons? Exactly. That's what it comes down to. Well, just read what it says here. Uh, He pointed out that the gods were to be parents of spiritual children, just as our heavenly father and heavenly mother were the parents of the people of this earth, following are the words of the prophet. Nowhere in the Bible do we hear, see anything about heavenly mother. Right. I know the Baptists, you know, not the Baptists, the Catholics, you know, put a lot of stock on Mary. Mary. Yeah. Uh, Mary was a righteous woman, but she's not, she, she's not, uh, uh, we don't pray to her or anything, but here they're talking about a heavenly mother that, the Bible doesn't mention. You're right. Where do you, again, who do you believe? Do you believe man or, or, or God? I want to I believe God. I think so. Uh, 
Got another one here, Milton R. Hunter, LDS Conference Report, April 1949, page 71. The prophet Joseph, Joseph Smith explained that, that this continuation of the seeds forever and ever meant the power of procreation. In other words, the power to beget spiritual spirit children on the same principle as we we were born to our heavenly parents. Again, heavenly parents, we have we have a heavenly father, but we don't right. have a heavenly mother. God the eternal father and our eternal mother. That it's just not there. Uh, and that he goes on to say that that's, uh, therefore man cannot receive the highest exaltation without a woman, his wife, nor can a woman be exalted without her husband. That is the fullness of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the plan of salvation. The plan of salvation. God, here's, let me give you God's plan of salvation. Th this is how you become a New Testament Christian. This is why Mormons are not New Testament Christians. Exactly. First of all, you have the, you know God's plan of salvation is you have to hear the gospel, Romans ten seventeen. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Uh, we have to believe John eight twenty four. Turn to John eight twenty four. We're going we're going to look these up for your all's benefit. John chapter eight, verse twenty four. Therefore, I said to, I said to you that you will die in your sins. For if you do not believe that I am He, you will die in your sins. Exactly. And then you, you, you must repent of your sins. Look at uh, Luke 13, 3. And what it says, I can quote it as, I tell you, nay, except you repent, you shall all re shall all Likewise perish. Likewise perish. You know, so, and that, he says that twice in verse 3 and verse, verse uh, 5. Then we must confess Jesus as the living Son of God. Look at Acts 8, 37. Acts chapter 8. We want verse 37. This is this is Philip and the eunuch, right? And, and you know what's interesting? It says up here, in a, in just a little bit further up, it said, and he opened it. Well, verse thirty-five, and Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. And as they went on their way, they came to a certain water, and the eunuch said, "See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized?" And what does Philip say to him? You don't have to be baptized. You don't have to do anything, right? No. In verse thirty-seven, and Philip said said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That's the confession we have to make. But we're still not saved. Uh, uh, we have, see, we cut, yeah, we cut repentance. Now we've got confession. Baptism. Then oh, we repent. have, we, we've already repented. Baptism. We already did. We have baptism now. Look at Mark 16, 16. Mark 16, 16. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. It takes you can't take one that that is a, a conjunction there, and it puts as much weight on believing as it does being baptized. Right. You've got to do both. You can't do just one. And look at Acts chapter two, verse thirty-eight. Acts chapter two, verse thirty-eight. And uh, there, there's more verses we could give, but. Uh, then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ. Why, Peter? For the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And Acts twenty two sixteen. This is a very important one. Acts chapter 22 and verse 16. And now why tarriest thou? In other words, let's don't wait. It's important. You do it now. We don't put it off right. for a week or a month or whatever. When we decide that we need to be a Christian, it is now, it's not later. Anyway, and now why tarriest thou? Rise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Paul was still in sin until he was baptized. And if you go back to chapter 9, you find where he had been praying and fasting for three right. days. Right, still wasn't saved. But he still wasn't saved. And he's recounting that to him here. And uh, look at Romans chapter uh, 6. Romans chapter 6 and verses 3 through 6. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death. In other words, that's when we get 
baptism, we get completely buried under water. That like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him and, and that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. We have only one way to be saved, and it's not having children that's going to save us. I'm, I'm not condemning having children. I've got three of my own. But children, and we're nowhere are we told that we're going to be in heaven producing more children. Uh, if You know, if what they teach here, that you have to have a woman, and Paul could not be saved. Uh, any single person could not be saved. It's just, and, and again, let's look at another thing here. The Journal of Disclosures, for volume 22, page 125. George Q. Cannon, October 31st, 1880. He go, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I'll just down it. If we obtain celestial glory and the fullest sense of the word, then we have wives, plural, and children in eternity. What is God's plan for man and woman? One man and one woman. Look at uh, Genesis ch chapter 2, verse 24. Genesis chapter 2, verse 24. Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave unto his wife, singular, and they shall be one flesh. Look at, uh, now turn to Matthew chapter 19. Matthew chapter 19. Actually, uh, well, I'm get into this. Uh, you got so much information yeah. over there. And then Matthew 19, we read in starting verse 4, and he answered and said unto them, Have ye not read that which that he which made them in the beginning made them male and female, and said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. Wife, 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 not wives, any place. Wherefore, they are no more twain, but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. Now, the point that we need to make, though, is, yes, in the Old Testament, they did have multiple wives. God did not approve of it. At this time of ignorance, he winked at, but now right. he wanted everybody to repent. That's right. So it's, it's not something that we can, we can say, well, yeah, we can have all the wives we want. That, that's not what God's plan was. It's one man and one woman for life. And, but there's so so much that they want to want to say here that, that that's not not correct. Right. Um, I, I think one of the things, and we've touched on this during the program, is this idea of Scripture guiding us and allowing Scripture and Scripture only to be our guide. And we looked at Second Timothy three and verse sixteen. And I like the application that is made in verse 17, where it says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and uh, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. It's Scripture that makes us complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Right. Scripture fulfills that. Why do we need an additional book? Why do we, we need something in addition? Why do we need something from a man? We don't. Well, in, in 2 Peter 1, 3, you know, he gives us everything we need for life and godliness. That's right. And it, his scripture, you know, we're, we're completely furnished with everything we need. So why do we need a book of Mormons or a, a catechism or anything else? That's right. All these different books that men have, books of discipline in the Methodist church and things of that nature that are in addition to the word. What's that thing that you say? If it's... Somebody if said to you, it contains the, yeah, go if ahead. If it's new, it's not true, and if it's true, it's not new. No, there's another one. That's, that's good. Um, the other one where the guy said to you, you asked him what was in his book, and he said oh, it has Oh, all yes, yeah. I, I, I was speaking to, a, to a, a young man that was going to the Baptist seminary, and I asked him about their book of whatever they call it. Oh, he says it says the same thing the Bible does. And I said, well, if that's true, why do we need it? Right. Why? I mean, what what good is it if it says exactly what the Bible does? But it does not say what the Bible. Does. No, it does. It does. And, and the Book of Mormon's absolutely. You know, one place that you didn't bring up there that I think is kind of interesting. Uh, Joseph Smith said that black people were a curse. 
Oh, yeah, I've got that one down here. Uh, and uh, the Bible teaches that God made one blood from all nations of men. Um, Acts chapter 17 and verse 26. Uh, Galatians 3 and verse 28 said it doesn't matter if you're male or female or any, Greek or, or uh, Jew. But the Book of Mormon in 2 Nephi 5 and verse 21 teaches that black skin is a sign of God's curse, so that white-skinned people are considered morally and scriptural, uh, spiritually superior to black-skinned people. Now, they're going to say, oh, we don't believe that anymore. Well, when but did you, it change? Yeah, you believed it when 2 Nephi 5 and verse 21 was written. Yeah. You know, so so they taught that. They talk, and why does it have to be changed? Because it's not the Word of God. You don't have to change the Word of God. The Word of God stands forever. See, but they have to change their Word we, over and over again. We can't change the Word of God. No. And we have no authority to do it. But, but they change that. That mean, that tells you right there it's not the Word of God. That's right. So all those people who lived during that time period and accepted Second Nephi 5 verse 21 as being true, as being the Word of God, and they treated black people that way, and now it's been changed, what happens to all those people? What happens to all those people that believe that way? Yeah, I mean, if it changed. What's going to change they, next? Uh, yeah. Uh, and I would say the same thing. If, if, so well, what in the Book of Mormon, what in the Pearl of Great Price, what in Doctrines of Covenant, what, what is going to be changed in these books five years from now, a hundred years from now, 200 years from now, that you're believing today, but, oh, well, we had to make a change in that, like polygamy. One group doesn't believe in polygamy. Right. Right, but another group does. What's the at one time you all did? Right. And so, why is there this changing that's going on? Why is all this stuff? That, that because it's not that inspired that's, by God. That's right, exactly. It's not inspired by God. It's not God. The Bible hasn't changed since it was written. Correct. Now there's been some translations come out. This, this some very sad yeah. translations yeah. that have come out. But but as far as you go back to the original Greek. Or by a, the King James Version. Sure. Is, is a very good version. The New King James is. It hasn't changed. Right. It says the same thing that it did 2,000 years ago. Well, but not quite 2,000. But it, the, the Bible was finally oh, completed well, yeah. in 95 yeah. AD. Well, the Old Testament was completed before then, and right. during the lifetime of Jesus, right. he read from the Septuagint, the Greek exactly. translation of the Hebrew Scriptures. Exactly. Um, and you know what? I'll say something about that. Uh, he never said to any of the people when he went into the temples, uh, went into the temple or he went into the synagogue to preach. He never said, I can't believe that you're trusting these, these copies of copies of copies of copies that you have. I can't believe you're trusting them. He never contradicted that what they had was the scripture. Why are people then contradicting today and saying, well, maybe this isn't right. Or this book says this, or that book says that. Um, if, if the Book of Mormon says the same thing the Bible says, then why do you need the Book of Mormon? But we we if, know from, what, the, from the contradictions that you've got there that it doesn't say the same thing the Bible right. does. So why do you need another book if the Bible is all sufficient and says that? You don't need another book. And it's not you. We can tell by the mistakes in it and everything that it's not inspired. Correct. Or the things that keep getting changed. Right. Well, we don't believe that. How can, you, how can we change the Word of God that is inspired? If the moral Book of Mormon is inspired, then we we still would have to look at blacks as a curse, and that's not true. Right. Nowhere in the scriptures and in, in God's word do you find that, that they're cursed because they're they're a different skin color. Right. Right, I agree. Well, if you have any questions or comp well, no, our time is up. <laughs> our time our time is up for this program. Let me remind you of some things that we offer. We offer this wonderful book called Why I'm a Member of the Church of Christ. You can uh, send us your name and address, and we'll get this book out to you absolutely free. If you're interested in a Bible study, we provide a free Bible study for you through correspondence. Uh, we pay for the postage. It uh, won't cost you anything, or if you want to do a study in person, you're available. Let me also invite you to join us. Uh, we meet on Sundays at 9.30 a.m. for Bible study, 10.30 a.m. for worship, and again at 5 p.m. for evening worship. We also have a Bible study, a midweek Bible study on Wednesday at 7 p.m. You're invited to come be with us. We have topics, uh, new topics every week uh, as far as the sermons go uh, that you can come. And it was taken right from the Word of God. And we want you to bring your Bible with you so you have a Bible and you're able to follow along with the lessons that we give. And then on Wednesdays, we usually do a series. Right. I, I would like to say this, though. You know, if, if you're out there and you're a Mormon, Latter-day Saint, or Community of Christ, or whatever, and you have questions, come to us. We'll be glad to sit down and study with you. Yeah. We're, we're not 
and we ain't going to holler at you. We, we will study with you. We, we will show you what the Bible says. We will not accept Book Mormon. No. But we will show you what the Bible says, and you can compare it to your Book of Mormons. You see there's a lot of differences. And we won't accept you as being Christians, just as we don't accept Baptists, Methodists, Catholics, Presbyterians as being Christians. They're not. They are not Christians. And so, but we're happy to study with you. Well, Leland, thank you for the things that you shared tonight. We certainly appreciate it. I want to thank all of you who tuned in to watch it. Let me say one more time, if you're watching this on another thread and it's been posted over there, if you, after this thread in, after this live ends, if you go and post things over there, I can't see those things. So you have to come over here and post them on our thread under our Facebook Live for everybody to be able to see them after the uh, live program is over. Appreciate you tuning in. We'll be back next week for What the Bible Says at 7 p.m. Thank you. Good night. Oh, oh.